first Peter chapter 5. It is the last chapter of the first epistle of the apostle. And even within this chapter, we will find a lot of fundamental truths that we can apply in our own lives. Okay, so let us take a look at this chapter and let us see what we can benefit from, from the Word of God. The notes in front of you will help you to follow up. And as we go along, you may want to really focus on what is being said because there's a lot of biblical truths that are being presented here by the Apostle Peter. Elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an, who am also an elder, now and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Now, first thing we can understand that Peter reminds them that he's an elder, and he exhorts the elders that are among them, among those churches that he's talking about, in Galatia, Cappadocia, Bithynia. He is exhorting them, like what he did, okay, and he's saying, "I'm also an elder." And he is also reminding them about the suffering, just as we suffer within Christ. Those that will be taken up at the final trumpet, or those that have gone before, that are in the Lord, will also be glorified when Jesus returns, and they can share in the glory. Okay. Now, verse two: Feed the flock of God which is among you. Now, it's very important when he says that because we've got to understand that the role of a preacher, a pastor, is to feed the flock of Christ. Feed what? The Word of God. Now, I placed a lot of verses in here. You've got Matthew chapter 26. Okay. Um, sorry, you've got uh, Matthew chapter 19, verses 27 to 29. And you've got to understand that the Lord expects His people, whether they are pastors, seminarians, preachers to feed the flock. Feed them what? The Word of God. Those that do not do so delude themselves about being ministers of Christ. Okay? Now remember what Jesus said. He said to them before that blessed is the servant who when the Lord returns is providing meat and drink to his flock. That is the mark of a true leader of Christ. And then he says, Woe to the servant. Okay? That means the preacher, the elder, to whom when the Lord comes back, finds him ill treating the flock of Christ and eating and drinking with the drunkards. Now, this doesn't have to be literally alcoholism, it also means indulging, revelry, okay, fornication. Doing the kind of things that eating and drinking the drunkards, as David Wilkinson once preached many years ago. Things like pornography, eating and drinking schmuck, computer games, that sort of thing. The law watches over everything. Okay? Now let's look at the next verse. Okay, I mean to continue with this verse. Taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Now, when people do it, they should not have constraints in what they're doing. They should not feel that, okay, look, now, taking the oversight means to see, it's like seeing the bigger picture. You've got to see the counsel of God. What are they supposed to do? They should not be constrained. Now, this is important. Many pastors in America, across the whole world, have admitted to David Wilkinson in a pastoral letter many, many years ago that they feel that they have no choice. Because why? The headquarters expects them to preach exactly certain things and they cannot go outside of the so-called accepted church doctrines. Now this stands directly against the commandments of the law. And also, it says, but willingly, they have to do so willingly, not grudgingly. As Paul says, be ready in season and out of season to preach, exhort, rebuke, refute. Because why? People should do it willingly. There's no such thing as I have a planned moment, let's say on Sunday, and suddenly I'm going to be very righteous in the Lord. Sunday Christians don't go to heaven. Okay. And not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Now this is so important. Those like Joel Austin, Benny Hinn, T.D. Drakes, Laura White. Liars like these. They do it for financial gains. You have the Kenneth Copeland's. The late Kenneth Hagin. These are the people who do it primarily for financial gains. 
And look at some of the names. You even have someone called Creflo Dollar. I mean, it's quite weird, you know. The point is that we've got to see that these are not ministers of God, but these are the wolves or rending the flock. We have to understand what is to be done. And the person who's doing the preaching, the elder, the church, or the messenger, they have to do it with a ready mind. It's not something whereby they feel that they are bound to do it because they have no choice. Okay? Now let's go to verse 3. Neither has been lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flocks of God. Now, you see, in this verse, I mean, uh, this chapter, and this verse, chapter 5, verse 3, it makes it very clear that the preachers of God, or the rulers, the pastors, are not lords. They're not supposed to be dictators over the church of Christ. They're not over the flock of God to try and rule over them, like some Pentecostal churches make it seem so. They are supposed to be examples to the flock. So that the flock can say, I have a good leader, I'm going to follow them. Four, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Now, as I mentioned, I mean, if you take a look at the scriptures that I've quoted in here, when Jesus returns, he will be giving them, he's the chief shepherd, okay? And he will give the elders who are shepherds also, a crown of glory, like what you can find in Revelation 4, chapter 10, okay? This is the crown that will never fade away because it's eternal life. It's the crown of life. It's the crown of righteousness that will never fade away. This is very important for everybody to understand. And those that do the will of the Lord will remain with the Lord forever. Now let's look at verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. You see... It's also important that the younger members of a fellowship have got to also understand that they've got to respect those that are above them. Now, if the pastor or the preacher is not willing to subject themselves to the Word of God, by all means, people within the church do not have to feel they should be subjected to such a man or a woman. But if the person doing the, the messenger is preaching from the Lord, Okay, the Word of God is putting the thing out clearly every Sunday and the flock of Christ can learn and be exhorted and be built up through the Word of God then they should respect such a person. They should. Okay, and they should listen to what is requested. Now, let's look at the next part of the verse. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisted the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Now this is very important. Everybody should be subjected to each other. That means it's not about lording over one another. Not trying to put other members of the church down, scolding them or whatever, or losing them up. It's about everybody being subject to each other. Loving one another as Christ has loved you. And everyone, okay, within the church has got to be humble. God resisted the proud. I mean, it's not... Feeling that, oh yeah, you know, I'm going to be there and uh, marry some of the lamb. No. It's about being humble. We cannot make any assumptions. People can fall away. Without the Lord, we're nothing. Only with the Lord are we sure of our election. And the Lord, okay, expects believers to be humble. In fact, we were reading just now, okay, Isaiah chapter 40. The Lord, okay, will bring down Okay, the, 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 the mighty, the arrogant. And he will lift up his own disciples on wings of eagles. And he grieves grace to the humble. Now six, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. That's why the Lord's mighty hand is all over the world right now. And man is not humbling himself before the Lord. They're not humbling themselves before the Lord. There's more arrogance than ever before. Narcissism. Is grown to extreme, extreme levels, and they are unwilling to humble themselves. Now, if we humble ourselves, surely the grace of God will reside on us in due time. And God, God waits for His people, and God will exalt His people when His Son, His blessed Son, returns at the final trumpet. Seven, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. 
You see, all our cares, our problems, should be at the feet of the cross. The Lord is the one who is going to be able to solve our problems. We do not rely on other human agencies or whatever to go and solve our problems. We should primarily come and turn towards the Lord and no one else except the Lord. Because it's the Lord who makes us rise. He is the one that's going to lift up his sheep on wings of eagles. It is wrong to make an assumption that a person, a man or a woman, or anyone else, a teenager, has got the answer to our questions when it should be all for the Lord. And by the way, just as an aside, a couple of weeks ago, one of our members received a letter by somebody saying that I'll ask my pastor for this. I find that very strange. Why not say I will turn to the Word of God for the answer? Isn't that strange? Talking about spiritual matters here, what makes that individual sure that the pastor has the answer? And if the pastor's church does not do hair covering, why would the pastor say that it's correct in the first place? And the pastor would know it. He definitely would have known it. It's in the Bible. It's obvious because that 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is a very, very popular chapter. and has to be studied by pastors. If the pastor was not convicted to have head covering in the first place, and he's been having a church that's gone on for some time without head covering, it means the pastor simply thinks it's not important. And this is called biased doctrinal idea. Why? It simply says, I'm going to go to the person who's going to tell me what I want to hear. But how about Alice Cofield's book, Demons in the Church? How come that was ignored? And second thing, if you think carefully, honestly speaking, I think we all know the answer here. Who do you think knows the Bible better? I have a feeling it's a Baptist pastor, New Baptist, quite a positive. Do you think it's that pastor from a church in Woodlands? Or do you think Alice Schofield knows the Bible better? And I'm quite certain that doctrine is dispensationalism when it comes to that time talking. So anyone, the nonsense that was spoken is so false. We can all see it for ourselves. It's very false. Because why? It, we don't need Alice Schofield. Alice Schofield is an old man. I don't know where he's now. He could be in Fort Myers, Cap, uh, California, whatever. I could go down to that church and we'll find out how little that pastor really knows. We don't need to go. We don't need to get... And let's go all the way down here. We can all take a look. There is so much nonsense. We do not rely on man, the agency. We rely on the Holy Spirit to illuminate the word of God for us. That's the thing we need. Now, sometimes the Lord may use writings of other spiritually gifted individuals like Alice Schofield, Pete Waldo, people like, for example, William McGraw. He may use such things to exhort us, yes. And such things are valuable. But primarily, it's the word of God that we follow. Now, A, be sober. Christians should be sober. It's not about being wild. Be vigilant. Now, we have to be vigilant. We got some people who used to attend this fellowship who were not vigilant. And they lost what they could have got. Because adversary, the devil is a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Now, the devil is not omnipresent. He's not God. The devil has to keep going around, okay? God is everywhere, okay? except in places where it's so unholy that God doesn't want to have anything to do with that place. But let me tell you this, the devil is a roaring lion. It's a tremendous roaring lion and he's going across the whole world, especially the Middle East, and he's really doing real damage. However, the devil doesn't work alone. You have to understand, the devil has his minions to help him. They're in every country, every continent. Okay, demonic forces are everywhere. And they can even prompt someone to write a silly letter. They will do even that kind of thing. Now, nine. Whom resist that fast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. What does this verse mean? We should rejoice knowing that there are other Christians likewise who are going through the same kind of tribulation as we are. So, if Satan is putting them to trials and tribulations, Rejoice, because we know we are not alone. We are not alone. We have others and examples. In fact, I've listed several in the notes. People like Polycarp, Justin Martyr, Yen Huss, Jerome, William Tyndale, John Hooper, Justin the Baker, Leonard Kayser, and millions of other Christians 
who laid their life down for the word of God and for the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what the mark of a true Christian is. And by the way, if someone says to me, or says in a letter, we are not saved through our doctrines. It is quite true. I want to deal with that little while. Okay? Yes, it's quite true in a way. The Bible never says directly that we are saved through our doctrines. But Jesus says, man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, which means the word of God. And if you go through the whole Bible, you will find there's so many examples. Okay? In Hosea says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge of what? Science? No. Math? No. The word of God. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, the word of God, I will also reject thee, and thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. And what is the law of God? What's written in the book of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, and all that. You see, they forgot the law of God, and he rejected them. Now, some will say, okay, this is the Old Testament. But the whole theme continues. It says in 2 John chapter 9, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, have not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he have both the Father and the Son. So, yes, the Bible doesn't say directly that if you follow doctrine, you're saved. But, if you have a correct heart condition, you will follow the Word of God exactly the way the Bible made it. Anyone that's trying to do that is called the sin of rebellion. We are all saved by our heart condition. So, at the meantime, we can go and forget the Word of God. That's what he's saying. He's lying. He's lying not to just... His sister is lying to whoever looks at him, he's lying to himself. And that's the worst thing. It's one thing to lie to somebody else, it's bad enough. It becomes worse when we lie to ourselves. And he's deluded. Really deluded. Son of Lucifer. Real son of Satan. And this is the thing that's shocking though. If you read it, and I finally got to read it, I was surprised at how much rubbish there was. In fact, if it's not for the severity of what he's saying and insulting my God, Okay, I would have got down and laughed hysterically because it was so ridiculous. But because of the severity of his words, I had to look at it seriously and say to myself, this is a deluded individual. Very deluded individual. Now let's get back. Okay, ready? Let's get back. 10. But the God of all grace, who have called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect. Now notice, God will eventually make you perfect. He will establish you, strengthen you, and settle you in the faith. So you will not be just floating in the wind, not wishy-washy, and not writing silly letters and saying, that, <laughs> okay, you know, doctrine isn't very important, that's implied. And saying that, oh, we don't need hair covering. And by the way, the thing about the hair covering is really, really ridiculous. It's really ridiculous. I'll come to that shortly. Okay? To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And remember, the glory and dominion is forever and ever. And we have seen it before. If you remember carefully, it's mentioned in Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 and chapter 5 verses 12 to 13. Glory belongs to Jesus and God the Father forever and ever. Amen. Now let's look at the last few verses. Huh? Verse 12. By Sylvania is a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose. I've written fully. Now, Paul has assisted in writing this epistle through Silas, okay? Silas is the Hebrew name. Sylvanus is the Greek name. I've written briefly, exalting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. Now, this is so important. This is very important for all of us. This alone can refute that nonsense that was written in the letter. You see, it's all about the truth. Anyone that claims truth is not important is not a Christian. Okay? The true grace of God where you stand. It's the true grace of God. Now, talking about heart condition, if a person says, oh, we are all saved by heart condition, it's true. But there's a twisting there, there's a complete tormenting of the text. Now, understanding, if a person's a real believer and they say, I really have the right heart condition, then they will follow what the Bible has to say. How can they come and claim, I love Jesus, and yet they still cannot love the truth? 
that is complete nonsense. Complete nonsense. Okay? And remember, the church that is Babylon, elected together with you, salute of you, and so do Marcus, my son. Now, remember, a lot of times when you see Marcus, my son, or Timothy as my son, it's spiritual son. We cannot infer too much that it's a literal son. Okay, the Mark that's mentioned here is John Mark, okay, who went with Paul and Barnabas to the first missionary journey. And he says, the church is Babylon. Now, several Christian authors have got this interpretation wrong. The church of Babylon is actually fundamentally a location that is in modern-day Iraq, Syria, around that region. We've got to understand it. Many people took this to be Jerusalem. Yes. There are some Christian writers, end-time writers, who claim that Paul, Peter, was talking about the church at Jerusalem and he called it the church at Babylon. And they use that to infer that Babylon the Great, the mother of all harlots and abominations there, is actually the Jews, Jerusalem. They got that sort of understanding. Now, where does it say it's Jerusalem? This is putting too much in. So they're adding to the word of God something that isn't there. 